Obviously, I mean, the plan sets out an incredibly ambitious agenda and includes a, a large number of very promising new ideas. Um, but there's obviously still a lot of work to get from here today to 200,000, um, as the title of this uh, conference suggests. And, and I want to start with funding. Um, the city aims to be, you know, uh, more aggressive in leveraging private capital. Um, and, and Eric, um, starting with you, one way to leverage private resources is through inclusionary zoning. Um, and, and my question is sort of how can mandatory inclusionary zoning work in, in some of the weaker neighborhoods in New York, weaker market neighborhoods where there won't be as much cross-subsidy available from the market rate units. The housing plan talks, you know, provides language talking about flexible options, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how that will work. Yeah, d definitely, and, and happy to do it. Um, you know, you're absolutely right that when you think about mandatory inclusionary housing, you think about this idea of cross-subsidy coming from the market component. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's kind of no magic to that. Um, these kinds of cross-subsidies are uh, somewhat, you know, they either exist or they don't exist. So you hear conversations that people might have about this idea that if you're looking at a location where rents are relatively low to construction costs and it requires subsidy to build, if you upzone that area, essentially what you're doing is creating new development rights, the equivalent of new land, all of which could require additional subsidy, direct subsidy as opposed to that cross subsidy. And we recognize that, and I, I think that is true um, to begin with. But you know, you also, and we spent a lot of time in the last four or five months looking at this, even behind the development of the plan, there's been working groups that are working on inclusionary, both on the preservation side and on the, the mandatory new construction side. Um, and, you know, to that point, w when you think about what happens in a rezoning, it happens at a moment, but the effects of it are not instantaneous and overnight. That, that rezoning is a rising tide that builds, and kind of the missed opportunity is not to recognize that potential for rising tide. So while you may be putting in additional direct subsidy at the beginning of that to develop that market and build that market, and by the way, build that market in all the ways that the commissioner just described about the other investments that are required to create that neighborhood while guarding against gentrification and overheating of that market, it's a mistake to think that you are not building a market, that density doesn't also create additional density, that you know, at times, um, and we all know this from other investment in other neighborhoods, that supply can create its own demand and that you can actually make markets. And it's important to be aware of that at the outset because you don't miss the back end of that. So if you anticipate that possibility and you plan for that possibility, you can lever that later. And I think that's an important part of what we're thinking about. Yeah. We know we're gonna have to go in with some upfront investments, but what we don't wanna miss is the, the, the back end of that, the back end of those investments. And we think that's very possible in many neighborhoods. And when you look at places like Williamsburg, for example, you know, it, it didn't go from land costs of 10,000 a unit at the rezoning to over 100,000 a unit overnight, and we did live through a recession in between, but the missed opportunity there was to not fully anticipate what could happen in that location, and that's something mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're guarding against. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea is that maybe initially there won't be as much cross-subsidy, but, but you're making an investment essentially, and a commitment to, to mixed income neighborhoods and, and locking in that Absolute, affordability down Absolutely, the road. and, and yeah. you know, just to, not to underpin it too much in an economics argument, but there is that whole, that, the idea of, you know, supply creating its own demand at some level, that, that products pay for themselves with the, the production of other products, and housing is very similar. The housing at the end of the day can pay for itself through the production of other housing. That mm -hmm. it's an economic investment that helps pay for itself over time as you build places mm -hmm. and you build communities. Mm -hmm. So that's an important part of the thinking as we go through this. And we've all, you know, I think it's important when you come to a conference, you could, you could read a lot of things, but you come to a conference to share ideas and important ideas and people want to really come and listen to something that could be new or thoughtful or that kind of cross-pollinates a conversation. And that's part of it, thinking about those types of investments in those types of neighborhoods. And, you know, you're, you asked a, a little bit of a finer point, too, that there might be nuances to how we implement it. And I think we are going to have to go neighborhood by neighborhood. When, when we look at the literature around San Francisco, it is a little bit of a very 
concentrated single price distance gradient. It's very dense in the middle, it's costly, it goes out, there's a little bit of lower income around the fringes. New York is unbelievably different than that experience. We have a ton of micro and sub markets that we have to think about and address. And each one of those is gonna have to, you know, is gonna require some careful planning, some thoughtfulness, and it's dynamic. Over time, we're gonna have to do, and we're looking again at all of our term sheets and our programs and our, our financing, we're gonna have to fine tune that as we move forward. So this is not something that's gonna be, you know, set in motion and let go. This is gonna be something that we are looking at and managing in an ongoing basis over the next eight to 10 years. So um, Todd, what, what Eric has um, spoke about sort of ultimately, you know, sort of making markets and, and ultimately drawing in the private sector. And, um, and I'd love um, for you to talk a little bit about what room there is for the private sector to play a greater role in, in funding affordable housing in New York. Yeah, and um, I think the short answer is that there, there is you know, a role for uh, greater participation by the private sector. And uh, we're really, you know, at least at Bank of America, we're really encouraged by the tone, some of the themes in the housing plan. Um, there's a tremendous amount of demand uh, right now for CRA lending and investment, right? And that's one part of our business. And I think that, um, you know, Private sector, not-for-profit, supportive housing developers are are getting the benefit of that. The project, the demand for project finance, and so if if the production levels go up, you know I think that there's enough demand to um, to absorb uh, and continue to be uh, aggressive about financing on the project finance side. Um, but uh, what the markets business, the lending and markets businesses uh, require is clarity. Um, and that's what I think we're starting to get now as we, you know, we've got the, um, the outline of the plan and we're starting to really get down into the details uh, of the plan. Um, I think that we will continue to see and refine um, financing strategies for project finance. But one, one of the things that I think that is really important, one of the themes that I think is really important that we're excited about is this neighborhood-based uh, approach, so the comprehensive approach to, um, to neighborhood building. Um, because that allows us to incorporate not just our uh, lending, tax credit investing, new markets um, investing uh, platform, but it also allows us to, to think about and talk about um, using financing that we have for s small business lending, mortgages, um, public finance, uh, the underwriting of tax exempt bonds, our CDFI lending business, we have a um, we have a uh, private equity fund of funds that uh, that invests in funds that are um, that invest in emerging markets and uh, and diverse uh, companies, um, and so I'm interested in engaging in a in a broader conversation. You know, if our theme is really going to be neighborhood building, uh, I'm interested in engaging, and I think that my you know my my peers across the uh, financial institutions business are interested in engaging in a more comprehensive way. Um, what can we, what other tools can we bring to the table? We have a bunch of other things that we can do. Um, and uh, how do we have a conversation about not just project finance, um, but how else the, the other things that we can, uh, the other financing tools that we can utilize um, to really build and focus on building communities, mm -hmm. uh, building business, building transportation hubs, um, building uh, home ownership, uh, areas of home ownership, mm -hmm. all of those things I think financial institutions can really, can really help with. The one other thing that I want to suggest as we start to think about this, and again, I, I'm very encouraged that um, uh, Commissioner Bean and uh, the rest of the folks in the, you know, the, the housing, uh, in, in housing at the city are talking about uh, refining the plan is let's think about ways that, um, you know, part of the reason that there's so much demand here in this market uh, is that there are, most institutions have high CRA needs. Um, as we start to think about um, developing more mixed income uh, projects and focusing on mixed income. Let's make sure that we're doing all that we can to set the stage so that financial institutions can take advantage of the CRA credit that they're able to um, receive from investing in and financing mixed income development. Think about ways to um, make enterprise communities, enterprise zones, uh, establish a, you know, a, a clearly defined plan for different neighborhoods so that we can, so that 
institutions can maximize their, uh, their the, the credit that they get for CRA for, for CRA lending um, because that's going to in, that's going to increase the interest um, in uh, providing financing in those in, uh, in those uh, defined areas and it's going to create uh, you know obviously more liquidity for uh, the type of development that you that you're trying to get to.